Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Radical History School uh, Tuesday night sessions. And it's my great pleasure tonight uh, to welcome uh, Professor Sue Milner uh, to this session. Sue's an expert on uh, Margaret Bonfield, who's a hero of the West Country, of course. <laughs> and um, Sue, so I know you're in for a, a fantastic evening. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to be delighted by what Sue's going to explain to you tonight about uh, the trials and tribulations of Margaret Bonfield. So thanks, <laughs> Les. Um, I spoke, yeah, I am not an expert on Margaret Bonfield at all. I'm an amateur, I'm a dabbler. Um, and I originally uh, offered a talk and gave a talk on Maggie Bonfield back in 2019. Um, this was really when Les approached me to speak at the Radical History School and um, the theme was breaking the mould and I wanted really to talk about uh, some aspect of, I suppose, women uh, breaking the mould. Um, and Maggie Bonfield had intrigued me for a while, but really what spurred me on was the discussions that took place in the public sphere in 2018 around the centenary of the Representation of the People Act, where um, there was so much talk of Nancy Astor and uh, people like Margaret Bonfield really didn't get a look in and um, Rachel Reeves, I think, tried and uh, various others tried to uh, raise her profile, but it really, um, it, to me, it seemed as though she needed to be rescued from oblivion. So that's what I was trying my best in my amateur way to do. And I think since then, if we can just go to the next slide. Next, the plaques, let me get through that one, this one. Are we having trouble, Tanya? We're moving Could on, you the, move on to the next one, Tanya? Oh. Technology is really letting us down. It is, yeah. Keep so going, and hopefully Tanya will. Yeah, the, I, I think I wasn't the only person in 2018, 2019, who was having similar thoughts about the need to rescue uh, Maggie Bondfield from oblivion. And uh, actually also in the unions with which she was involved in the TEC, um, so Osdor and GMB in their uh, current uh, incarnations started to talk about um, Bonfield. Uh, so if you look at websites, you'll see that they um, produced resources and started to talk about her life. And so a lot of people were saying the time is right for uh, a major reappraisal of Bonfield's um, work and contribution. And the plaque that I wanted to show, so there was a plaque unveiled in Chard, her birthplace, uh, in 1985 by Barbara Castle. Um, in 2021, I think, there we are. Um, a plaque was unveiled in Hove above the shop where she, uh, f at the age of 14, was apprenticed uh, in a draper's uh, shop. Uh, and that was the work of, I think, local Osdor and uh, local MP Peter Kyle who'd worked for several years actually to get that blue plaque up there. So um, you'll see that also um, quite a few museums have started to look at their resources that they're holding on uh, Margaret Bonfield and to put together um, short biographies on the website. So um, the screen presence, the online presence of Margaret Bonfield has increased greatly, I think. Um, and it's worth just saying before I move on that uh, oh, she's always been up there on the Tolpoddle site, a very brief biography uh, as coming from the southwest from Chard, and also being a good subject for Tolpoddle scholars because of the nonconformist political tradition that she represented. She came from a radical nonconformist family background and wrote about this in her autobiography and paid tribute to the Tolpoddle martyrs. So, as I say, since 2019, more interest in Maggie Bonfield, but I think still some what I would call uncomfortable silences. And I did think about calling the talk tonight uncomfortable silences revisited, but I, I suggested instead from hero to villain. 
because a lot of people seem to focus then in celebrating the life and contribution of Maggie Bonfield on her early career when she was a more attractive figure, um, physically attractive as uh, young and petite, and uh, as she got older, um, seen as less so. Uh, and obviously for a woman that uh, is seen as a, as a very damning um, kind of attribute, but also that uh, once after uh, 1923, at the age of um, 50, she made the transition really from a union career into a political career, that that uh, transition for her was very damaging and led to um, a lot of criticism later. And I think part of that uncomfortable silence and the oblivion that surrounded her uh, life since then has been to do with that sense that she's not talked about because um, she was a failure. So that's what I want to talk about tonight, really, to sort of re to talk about the uncomfortable bits. Um, the next slide, Tanya, if you can manage to go on to that. I suggest some um, reading. There's actually a lot written about uh, Maggie Bonfield, but um, Perhaps some of the controversy uh, that surrounds her relates to the resources available and her uh, Bonfield's autobiography has been from 1948 has been used quite a lot, cited quite a lot. Um, I thought that her autobiography um, was indicative of the resources available. So she wrote it towards the end of her life. Her memory was failing. Um, as she acknowledged herself, and she relied quite a lot on her diary and personal papers. So my assumption was, when I first looked into this, that the archive, her personal papers, which are in the USA, Vassar College, um, New York, that there wouldn't be very much that added to what we already knew from secondary sources and the autobiographical material and biographical material that's already been published and memoirs also of um, women who were active in the labour movement uh, from that same period. But um, I've realised, and this is actually from talking to Paula uh, Bartley, who's in the audience tonight, and who wrote um, Labour Women in Power, where there are two chapters, uh, kind of definitive chapters on, uh, authoritative chapters on um, Maggie Bonfield, because Paula has been to the Vassar archives and um, from talking to Paula, then I'm aware there's a lot more probably that still is uh, there to be used. And so I suppose one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, what what would we look at next if we were able to try and dig deeper into Maggie Bonfield and to try and sort of uncover some of these uncomfortable areas? So um, next, Tanya, if we can just have a quick timeline. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the early years, but they're relevant, obviously, to what came later, given that so much of her life up to 50 years of age was spent in the labour movement and particularly building the women's trade union movement. But by 1923, she was already making a transition from uh, women's trade unionism, which, as we know, was largely outside of the textile unions, um, independent, although in her case, in the Shop Assistance Union, um, that was a union for men and women, a mixed union. But uh, she was very concerned uh, in the work that she did with building women's organisation, because, of course, women were less organised um, than men, male workers. So very, very quickly, as I say, she came from uh, this radical nonconformist family, had very little, very little uh, formal education, uh, went to work at the age of 14 and received an education and a political education through contacts, through church and a social reform movement, which was initially a sort of liberal nonconformist um, um, circle. And then once she went to London later at the age of 19, she was introduced to trade unionism. Her brother already, uh, a printer, was um, a father of chapel, I think, by then. So he already uh, introduced her to the trade union movement, but she became involved in the shop assistance union, famously after reading about it in a newspaper in which her fish and chips were wrapped as she walked across London. So she began this arduous work of organising uh, shop assistants, 
and um, also working to investigate conditions undercover and document them and get publicity. Uh, because although working hours had been uh, begun to be regulated in Britain, um, shop work was notoriously under-regulated and what regulations there were weren't respected. So the working conditions were really very poor, wages were low, um, there was the phenomenon of living in um, under miserable conditions. Um, so she set out to investigate these. She was then, uh, she then took part in uh, investigations conducted by Margaret Gladstone and others on um, workers where she focused on shop workers and this is widely seen as uh, having led directly raised public awareness about the um, poor working conditions of shop workers which led to the uh, 1911 Shops Act uh, limiting working hours to five and a half um, days a week with a weekly limit of 60 hours and imposing breaks so you could see that there was a, um, a real contribution in terms of raising public awareness, not just about shop workers, actually, but more generally, the plight of women workers. And she also, as an organiser, did all of that slogging work, which um, helped to double the membership of the Shop Assistance Union. 1899, she was delegated to TUC, made a powerful impression um, as a young woman speaker, um, where she called for a strong labour movement and uh, the two arms of the labour movement working together so she called for trade unions to be organised within a political um, labour party as well. She resigned from that organiser post in 1908 um, and broadened out her act activities so she became more of a public personality but she was also then involved from 1906 with the National Federation of Women's Trade Unions working with Mary MacArthur um, and uh, Marion Phillips and others. Um, became involved in the Women's Cooperative Guild after 1912. So she was a really leading figure in women's trade unionism. And then that also led to her going into the male world of trade unionism. Um, she uh, secured a seat on the TUC Parliamentary Committee in 1918, was elected onto it in 1918 and then um, was elected chair of the General Council of the TUC in 1923. So she'd already by 1923 notched up a very impressive set of firsts, really a woman a, and a young woman still um, in those early firsts, delegated to TUC um, and then getting uh, elected onto the Parliamentary Committee and General Council. So in 1923, she then uh, apparently was, uh, told by Ramsay MacDonald that she should go into the political world and focus on politics rather than trade unions. She stepped back from the ILP at that point and focused on the chair of the General Council post uh, and the uh, TUC work and the National Federation of Women's Unions um, at a time when the women's unions were uh, going through this process of amalgamation into the men's uh, labour movement. Um, but she couldn't resist standing for Parliament. She'd already tried unsuccessfully twice. And in 1923, uh, if we can go on to the next slide, sorry, I was trying to do it myself. <laughs> Thank you, Paula, who I think is in the audience for this photo on the left. I absolutely loved this, so I wanted to show it to you. Um, so this is a photo of uh, Maggie Bonfield canvassing uh, on a stool in the street in 1923 when she was uh, elected, finally. And um, there is a photo on the, on the right. So it was only three uh, women Labour MPs um, elected, the first women MPs to be elected in their own right, rather than as representatives of their husband. Um, in January 1924, she made her first speech where she talked about the work she'd uh, been doing, um, and I've kind of missed that out, but 1914, she, along with Mary MacArthur, Susan Lawrence, Marion Phillips, were invited to join the Queen's Committee, the Central Committee, Advisory Committee on Women's Employment, and it was looking initially at the problem of women made redundant in the first phase of the war. And it then went after the war on to look at training of women who were made redundant, uh, originally displaced by male workers coming back from the war. So she'd had this experience that she'd built up in um, 
works, training and uh, work creation schemes for women made redundant. And this made us something of an expert on unemployment, although she hadn't really looked at the nuts and bolts of the unemployment scheme. So that was the subject of her first speech. And then a few days later, she was asked um, to join the government as parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Labour, which meant that she gave up the TUC post. And um, the great problem to be tackled uh, by the Ministry of Labour and the government was unemployment. So um, she, um, under Tom Shaw, she was working for Tom Shaw, who um, had to come forward with proposals on unemployment insurance. Um, in 1911, just to recap, uh, briefly, and you'll know this, so I, I won't spend a long time on it, but 1911, Britain had pioneered a national scheme of unemployment benefits based on compulsory contributions. It was a, a pioneering scheme in um, the world. Um, from the beginning, this is a liberal scheme, and from the beginning it ran into trouble. The Labour position uh, from 1911 was opposition to this scheme. Um, Labour called instead for full maintenance by the state rather than um, an insurance based system. Bondfield him, herself and uh, Macdonald supported um, the insurance principle. And you can see kind of why from um, Bondfield's trade union background, because trade unions had invented this idea of um, benefits for, based on contributions and pooling resources. But um, the Labour Party position was um, led by Snowden and others, and they felt the state should underwrite this because, of course, um, only a certain number of workers were able to contribute and therefore it excluded large numbers. Um, now, there's been a huge literature on Labour's position on unemployment, so its official position was opposition to the scheme. But what happened was that um, in opposition to Conservatives and then, of course, when it was in power, it um, engaged with the nuts and bolts of the scheme. So this focused on um, several things, but one was the level of benefits. So in, in practice, Labour developed a whole set of other proposals which were about more immediate gains. Because what happened was Conservatives in office were reducing the level of benefits, raising contributions for workers and employers, trying to limit the liability of the state. Um, they also restricted access um, based on number of contributions. And once benefits were exhausted, they um, put very strict conditions around who could then continue to claim under what was then called uncovenanted benefit, which Labour later changed to extended. And then the third thing was means testing um, and debates around genuinely seeking work. So what happened was that Labour and practice grappled with all of these uh, aspects of the insurance scheme, and it had to do that in 1924 when it was in office. So the 1924 Labour government was a minority government, a very small uh, minority, and it relied not just on Liberals, but also Conservatives to get its legislation through. And so Shaw's um, way of dealing with this was to try to focus on um, um, raising the level of benefit, getting rid of uh, means testing, and um, removing um, the ministerial oversight of the shift onto what was then termed extended benefits, previously uncovenanted. So benefit was raised. Um, but Snowden, um, as Chancellor, had a different set of priorities which were around controlling costs and so um, the compromise position in all of this was accepting the genuinely seeking work clause so from the beginning uh, in Bonfield's parliamentary and ministerial career she had then gone onto that terrain of accepting that um, there had to be some control of um, the conditions under which people claim benefits in order to prevent abuse um, she then uh, lost her seat later that year when the government collapsed after the um, Zinoviev letter um, and she argued that it had all been too much, <laughs> that it had been a minority government, uh, it had uh, found it difficulty to focus on priorities 
and um, it hadn't, for example, then been able to um, focus on the other side of its work because labour policy was also to build up um, the works programmes. It never really was able to do this in anything like the scale that was needed. So um, the 1924 manifesto um, that Labour put forward was really quite interesting because it sort of soft pedalled on a lot of these questions, really. Um, but then once in opposition, Labour went back on the offensive and went back to its position of the full maintenance for workers. So this takes us on then to the Blainsborough Committee. And so th this is one of the things that really has sullied um, Bonfield's reputation um, at the time and later. It's been the subject of a lot of academic interest from social policy scholars um, and scholars of unemployment policy. As Labour had tried to get its unemployment insurance legislation through Parliament, it had had to accept from the opposition the principle of uh, a thoroughgoing review. And this would look also at these questions of uh, means testing and genuinely seeking work. It's quite interesting that the employers um, um, were also now starting to push very much for the state to take over a bigger share of responsibility for funding the uh, insurance scheme. So this review was entrusted to um, Lord Blainsborough, who'd just been made a uh, law lord and given a life peerage uh, in 1923. And uh, Margaret Bonfield, now out of office, was invited to join uh, the committee uh, representing uh, trade unions alongside two other trade union reps. She was definitely seen not just as the most pro high profile union representative on the committee, but she was seen as the most high profile member of the committee full stop. Um, the other trade union representatives were uh, Frank Hodges um, and uh, Albert Edward Holmes of the printing union. So Holmes is not, you know, a very high profile union uh, leader, although he was a long serving member, um, general secretary of his union. Um, and Frank Hodges had uh, recently resigned from his post in the Miners Federation because he had been making suggestions about workers um, should be prepared to accept low rates of pay rather than be unemployed. Um, and he was he resigned before he was pushed. So he was already um, out of favour with the trade union movement before he was nominated to sit on this committee. And just looking at the composition, you kind of think, um, what was the TUC doing in putting forward these appointees? It evidently um, had trouble um, filling the posts, I think. The TUC and Labour Party jointly submitted evidence to the committee, which um, showed this more adventurous approach to, in inverted commas, to unemployment insurance than they had shown when they were themselves in office. It argued for a, in favour of a higher level of minimum benefits, it's the highest that people were asking at that time a pound, um, in favour of uh, state fun funding uh, in, and full maintenance. But they also said this was an ideal position and that there were immediate um, demands as well. And the immediate demands focused on rising benefits, the end of extended benefit as a discretionary right and training centres for the unemployed. So Margaret Bonfield later claimed that she had um, on the committee pushed a line which was consistent with that document, but it was consistent mainly with the immediate side of the document rather the ideal position. She and the other two trade union um, appointee signed the Blainsborough report rather than issuing a minority report. Um, and she later said that this was that because she felt it was imperfect, but certainly better than what existed already, and that she agreed with its general principles. And the general principles did support the position that, um, that funding shouldn't be taken over wholly by the state, but more equally. The state was the um, smallest contributor, employers um, uh, the largest, and it also they also recommended reducing workers' contributions alongside employers. Um, now, 
when the uh, committee reported, the Minister for Labour, Sir Arthur uh, Steele Maitland, recommended implementing all of this in full. But um, Churchill, as the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, said no. So that um, really important principle of Blainsborough, which Bondfield had supported, was not taken up. And she then start, um, criticised it. So once she wasn't on the committee, she criticised it. Um, and what happened when then the Conservatives took forward the Blainsborough recommendations was that they started to um, reinvigorate this discourse of malingerers and abusers. And so this was taken up in the press. The other thing that happened was that benefits were reduced um, rather than so rather than the more generous system that um, Blainsborough committee had um, recommended. Um, and perhaps naively, it had recommended um, a greater share for the state and more generous contributions for workers, um, but based this on much more optimistic projections of what the unemployment rate would be than actually turned out to be the case. So she's been uh, very heavily criticised and she was criticised at the time. There was a special meeting of the party and uh, TUC to look at this and um, the three trade union uh, representatives were censured. Bonfield was singled out for particular criticism. Uh, there was a motion of censure at TUC. She fought against this and then that um, criticism was subsequently revoked and she was kind of given a clean bill of health. But this um, accusation of betrayal stayed with her. And certainly the trade union leaders who were in office at the time, the TUC leaders, um, later really distrusted her when she went into government in 1929. Um, I won't say any more of that, but I think that's one of the key questions, you know, what really happened on the Blainsborough Committee? Um, one of the questions I have in my head is around, because obviously the, the bulk of the work was done in 1926 when so much more was happening in the Labour movement. And um, I do wonder how much time she had to deal with the details, the nuts and bolts of this. And maybe she did in focusing on the basic principle which she supported, um, really underestimate how much the details were going to be problematic. There's an accusation of naivety which later came up in 1929 that when she was putting forward proposals for unemployment insurance, um, they uh, were later taken up by a Conservative, uh, well, by the national government, and they were taken up in a way that um, really emphasised this idea of uh, abuse of unemployment benefits. And so Eleanor Rathbone, in particular in Parliament, accused Bonfield of naivety when she had, was putting forward proposals. So finally, much more damaging participation in the 1929 um, Macdonald government. She'd been returned to Parliament, um, having uh, lost her seat, this time in the safe um, Labour seat of Wall's End, um, because the incumbent had stood aside for her. Blainsborough had damaged her standing in the constituency, but she defended herself and um, was returned. As I say, she'd um, also criticised the committee by then. There is incidentally a video on YouTube from a newsreel at the time where Bondfield introduces her fellow Labour women, uh, MPs, nine of them in 1929. So you can hear her famous voice, which most people describe as a lovely voice, clear ringing voice, um, although various male um, historians have said that she was strident. Um, so problems of the uh, 1929 government, we've already, uh, I've already looked at one, which was that it had this quite radical policy on unemployment once it was in office, it didn't put that in place and it was dependent on liberal um, votes to get it through. The policy of that time was class war, no deals with um, liberal MPs, but in practice, Bondfield was talking to um, liberal MPs to try and get things through. Um, she had very difficult relationships with the TUC general counsel at that time. Um, and there's a whole set of discussions in uh, Skidelsky's book, which is one of the main sources that's been used for that period, where he accused her of um, ineptitude, really. 
um, mismanaging these relationships, which had deteriorated by now. Her defense at the time was, so she was kind of playing these different, these games, which you do in parliament of talking to people and saying, well, yes, I listen to you, but um, the prime minister won't allow me to include you directly in the drafting of proposals. And so she was really caught between the, the TUC and um, the prime minister chancellor. Her position was difficult also because um, she wasn't solely in charge of unemployment benefits. And in fact, um, if you look at cabinet notes from that time, she really played a very minor role if the notes are to be believed. And the people speaking out were much more Jimmy Thomas as Privy Seal. So she was carrying out policies that effectively were subject to what Thomas was doing in terms of overall policy and certainly Snowden's blanket refusal to increase uh, funding. And she herself kept saying that she didn't want to borrow to prop up the insurance scheme, but she repeatedly went back to Parliament to ask for further borrowing. So I think the main criticism, um, I'll probably need to finish soon, relates to the Anomalies Bill, which was eventually passed in 1931. Um, so as this legislation was going through Parliament, then um, government really adopted a discourse that had come from Conservatives. And the Conservative discourse was about um, abuse of benefits. Um, and so um, they singled out in this. They said, well, we've got genuine claimants and not genuine claimants. And they uh, questioned the labour market attachment of two groups of workers. One was seasonal workers and one was married women. So they were claiming that married women, you know, kind of dabbled in the in the labour market. And so um, special enforcement measures had to be introduced which treated married women as anomalies. And this was really damaging symbolically because she had been a woman trade unionist fighting. That was her area of expertise and special interest. And um, she, at the time she was singled out for criticism. The only two MPs in parliament who stood up to support this were herself and Marion Phillips. It was pointed out that both of them were single, um, never married, and that they were um, uh, supporting legislation on behalf of, uh, that was excluding married women or not excluding them but tightening up the conditions and the effect of tightening up the conditions could be seen it did exclude a lot of married women um, in practice so her work was overshadowed by that bigger picture of cuts and worse she she was bound by a personal loyalty to the labor leadership and although she criticized them privately um, she didn't then leave them in the in the chamber when Macdonald formed the national government, despite her misgivings. So um, I think in some ways I would, uh, I think there's room to go back and look at those detailed uh, accusations, particularly from somebody like Skidelsky of ineptitude and bad faith in the work that she did. But I think that idea of political expediency and being willing to throw married women to the wolves in order to you know, get the legislation through or in order to keep the, a Labour government in government, those accusations probably have uh, mileage in them. As various authors have shown, and, and Paula Bartley develops this idea of the glass cliff, you know, that she was there really as a lightning rod for um, the unpopularity that Labour leaders knew would accompany the work that they were doing on unemployment. Um, she was sent out repeatedly to defend in Parliament um, measures that um, had Conservatives been putting forward, she would have been there very vocally opposing. Um, she suffered a breakdown after the strain of being a cabinet minister in the difficult uh, times and the loss of her uh, parliamentary seat, although as judge notes, um, it was a respectable defeat in, in some ways, um, given the disastrous uh, drop in Labour's national vote. Um, so to finish, I think, you know, it's possible to salvage something of that reputation, but um, particularly that question of the anomalies bill um, is something that's quite damaging and it, it um, fits in with the criticism that's been made that what Bondfield and her 
Labour women colleagues were doing um, was kind of setting up opportunities for women that were not particularly the opportunities they wanted. So promoted training for women um, to go into domestic service. Having said that, um, the Labour market at that time was so heavily gendered that opportunities for women to retrain if they'd been made redundant as textile factory workers were really extremely limited. Um, so I think thinking those questions through, and those are all about that relationship between class and gender, um, there's still probably work to do, I think, on Margaret Bondfield, and maybe the archives still have more to tell us. I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much, Sue. Oh, that was brilliant. I, you know, for a dad, well, I think you've done a fantastic job there, um, if I might say so. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I was going to start with her early career and this working undercover, but perhaps I'll come back to that in a while. Um, it seems to me that this whole problem regarding Blainsborough could almost relate back to the 19th century and the treatment of the indolent poor. This idea that you always have poor who are going to be malingerers, who are going to uh, create you problems with the poor law or with uh, benefits and that just carried on into into this administration in the in 1920s would that be fair do you think that that's this is a problem we still haven't resolved in many ways it's still something that's pertinent today we still hear it today uh people misusing the benefit system and all the rest of it it's nothing there's nothing new there the problem with margaret's view on that was um was this anomalies bill but we just go back to this idea of the indolent problem it, would it be fair to say that 19th century thinking was still very much in this government's mind? In in which? In the Labour government's mind? No, in the Conservatives, I think, in, in this the idea that they needed... The Conservatives, definitely, because, but that's also expedient. So the, the Conservatives um, were, were sort of undermining that insurance-based system all the time they were running up huge deficits and this was one of the so so bonfield was criticized i think at one point for saying that it was dishonest to run up these these debts and you know um to to, to borrow money in order to write up in but i think really so there'd been this experience where the conservatives were quite happy for the thing to flounder because they were not that interested in certainly not in using public money to support um unemployed workers so they were running up colossal debts um and then you know the labor government would come in and try to work out how how to shore it up so it was sort of firefighting the whole time and so it was very easy then to draw on those older because you know the poor laws um were still operating you know into uh, and that's why that's in 1911 the the um, Liberals had put forward this, um, you know, all the work of Beveridge had put forward a, an insurance based system. It was to try and say, well, this is this is related to the nature of work rather than being about the nature of poverty, if you see what I mean. And it, yeah. was, and it was also about saying that because it's about the nature of work, this we need in some ways to make re employers responsible for workers so that was a different kind of discourse that was associated with the 1911 act but conservatives repeatedly were able to sort of push all these buttons about an undeserving um, malingering body of unemployed you know with weak labor market attachment and um you know just ab abusing the system because all of that all of that you know public cultural consciousness about the deserving and undeserving poor around the poor laws was still there hadn't really been swept away um and so of course it was easy then in the press to get because the newspapers were interested in picking that up um so yeah i think uh, all of those things once they're out in the public domain then become very difficult to challenge bonfield herself challenged that and she went out um, you know, gathering, assiduously gathering evidence and then coming back and saying, well, you know, I've heard so-and-so um, kind of um, gossiping about neighbours who um, are, are uh, claiming benefits but not really out of work. But the committee, the Blainsborough Committee, didn't find evidence 
And as I say, Bonfield herself, when this was um, raised in Parliament, vigorously challenged the notion of widespread abuse of the system. It's still, it's still present today, isn't it? I mean, even last week we had government ministers saying, you know, why don't you go and join the army if you can't get a job? Um, Mr. Rees Mogg, I believe that was. Uh, that's that very same idea in many ways, uh, which yeah. is interesting. And therefore, you know, this whole thing is personal. And it's why I think we should be looking again at the part that Margaret Bonfield played in it and trying to reevaluate it and trying to salvage some of her reputation. Because I, I don't know whether you'd agree with me, but I think that Blainsburg committee was really a poison chalice. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think she, in in all these, you know, these certainly in in the in the with the Blainsborough Committee and in 1929, she was handed poison chalices. I think that's fair to say. Um, you know, what what capacity would she have had, even with her, um, you know, network of connections within the trade union world and outside of that, you know, the the in the uh, wider women's movement, nevertheless, it's not the she couldn't then and you know you, you read um historians say well Bonfield didn't come up with a great plan for unemployment, but really in the positions she was in, she wouldn't have she didn't have that capacity to come up with a great plan. So it's kind of a surprising accusation, I think. But but the Blainsborough committee I still would like to know more about because I think um it seems it seems to me that what um, Labour and the TEC did a little bit was it um, it, di it didn't want to oppose the committee outright and it wanted a seat there to be able to work out what was going on and but um, it's it by keeping it at arm's length what it could do was then um, invoke a plausible deniability and it could then revert to a position where it was saying well you didn't um implement the line um but i think you know realistically that that's always the case with these commissions and so when you get i mean um bonfield herself went in 1929 set up this morris uh committee there were two trade union representatives on it and they both signed a minority report because they had learned the lesson they knew that uh, what they needed to do was kind of um, mark clear water between their position as representatives of the of trade unions and what a government might do when it was in office. But um, she learned the hard way. She she really learned the hard way, didn't she? So I mean, what was the political makeup of this Blainsborough committee? So you see, we talked about the three trade unionists. What were the other members? How many other members were there? And what was the uh, the political makeup of it. There was obviously members of the government and members of the opposition, but we, do we know who else? There were, no, it was um, it's kind of an odd committee, I think. It was quite large. Um, there was uh, Blainsborough himself, you know, a, um, a law lord as the as the chair. There, um, there was Sir James Lithgow, who was the Scottish shipyard owner, representing employers. He was there in a personal capacity, but he'd been, I think, vice president of the National um, Confederation of em Employers Organisations. And so uh, he was reporting back to the organised employers lobby and they were able to um, kind of coordinate quite effectively. Um, there were represent quite a few civil servants um, there were representatives of local unemployment assistant board assistance boards, so they were there, kind of giving this story about who is claiming on what basis. Um, um, yeah, and lots of civil servants, as I say. So, um, Christy, oh, and the, you sorry. know, and the usual kind of aristocratic people. Who, so there was yeah. um, Viscountess Milner, absolutely no relation. Let me say. Um, <laughs> I don't have any truck with the um, imperialist uh, Milner <laughs> people. Um, so she, yeah, she was there kind of representing the imperialist interest um, for some reason. Uh, but okay. very often on these committees, you would get that's, you know, an aristocrat brought in to represent yeah. somebody of the establishment. Christine Coates has written you for a really interesting talk. Definitely time for Bonfield to be retrieved and researched. I hope someone will work on a new biography. Not mentioned tonight was a workers' internationalist, uh, yeah. e.g. in the International Federation of Women Workers, and also in the leading the 1920 TUC delegation to Russia. She certainly went to Russia, didn't she? Yeah. Uh, with that TUC delegation, do you want to talk about that for a couple of minutes? 
Yeah, also um, delegations to the um, ILO. So, she, you know, she was there in that founding period of the um, International Labour Organization and taking part in all of those discussions about work and time. And um, so, yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, if you want to read Anne Oakley's book on, on um, women and the building of the peace movement, it's a really important contribution that women, particularly in the labour movement, but in the wider women's movement, um, played in, in the peace movement. She attended several peace conferences. Um, and Anne Oakley makes the point, I can't remember if I ended my talk uh, in 2019 on this, but I wanted to, I might have run out of time. Anne Oakley makes the point that um, a lot of these women like Bondfield who were there involved in so many different campaigns. She campaigned you know, with the Women's Cooperative Guild on maternity benefits. Um, and so, you know, a really important part of the building of the National Health Service came from that work of Labour women, Marion Phillips as well, you know, because they saw that in order to improve maternity services for women, you had to um, have a coordinated health service that with local delivery. Um, so there's all of that work, um, work at local level, um, and then all of that uh, work in the international peace movement and um, a sense that um, the of a link between those local studies and the international level and she says you know yeah quite so, sorry it's connected that's that's Anne Oakley's point that you know by studying women like Margaret Bonfield what you get is a sense of how all of that connects she she had a, a rough time in Russia didn't she she traveled huge distances yeah, also some um, and, of the trips she did in the in the states, which she loved, but you know, I don't. I, I think the travelling conditions were really quite um, difficult. And in Russia, it was all done on uh, trains and with very little food. Yeah, I seem to remember reading that she stayed there longer than many of the men uh, and carried on investigating uh, conditions in Russia. That's, there we go. Um, there is a diary of her uh, her time in Russia, which is in the TUC library. I think she had quite a good time, actually. I think she found it quite interesting. Yeah, that's great, Christine. And I noticed you put up there that, please see the Bonfield papers in the Tuckwell collection of the TUC library. You looked at that, Christine, yourself, have you? You're muted, Christine. You're muted. I was the librarian there, but it's a... Uh, the, the, Bonville, the Bonfield papers are a really interesting collection and it's mainly focusing on her internationalist work. Um, and uh, I think the Russian diary is, is really interesting. Yeah, it's worth having a look at. Yeah. This is amazing. You read it, you know, and then when she was in the States, they went off and met Trotsky. She met um, Lenin, I think, when she was in, in Russia. So. Um, yeah, and and just you know the way in the diary, but she records how interested she was in meeting ordinary people and how overjoyed she was when the yeah. little girl brings the bunch of flowers. So um, yeah, there's there's a lot there. I think it's rich, a, a rich life, and you know a very unconventional life in lots of ways. And we haven't talked about that either. But you know, just I, no. I just feel you know a, a lot of the. Um, kind of male gaze that uh, denigrated um, some of those women um, like herself who you know who were spinsters and somehow distrusted because of it and yet you know they they were unmarried they gave their life to the movement they had these very close female friendships and built you know women women's networks as a result of those close you know, so it's unconventional in lots of ways that are also relevant today and that seem very contemporary, I think. So Andy Lincoln's come in with a question. It seems to me that she got her first junior minister appointment very quickly after becoming an MP. Does this suggest she was well regarded by the Labour Party? And did her relationship with Asdor, which came later as a union, but the shop workers union, is her time as a minister and MP? There's two questions there, really. Was she well regarded by the Labour Party? Certainly by Ramsay McDonald, yes. she was, wasn't she? Yeah, I think she was generally well regarded. She had really built up a, um, a, a strong reputation. She was well regarded because she had been there supporting the, the building of the Labour Party. She had very close friendships with a lot of the Labour leaders, if not directly 
with them, with their wives, who often were very, were independently active politically. Um, so she she was well regarded, and um, she was she she'd um, arbitrated in several disputes. So it, so she was seen as somebody who was an able organizer, investigator, but also somebody who could take on positions of authority. Um, to that level that they had the respect and authority to arbitrate um, in, you know, the um, boilermakers dispute, the shoemakers yeah. boot makers dispute that had been going on a long time and that nobody had been able to resolve until then. Um, so the and second the, part the of Andy's shop... question. Sorry? Yeah. I said the second part of Andy's question is, did her relationship with the shop workers, you know, survive her time as a minister and MP? She she left the shop assistants behind. I mean, um, Ellen Wilkinson, of course, came through the shop assistants union as well. So I think she still had personal contacts there. But she um, her, she was more active in the general and municipal workers union by that stage through the um, national federation of women trade unions. So. Um, yeah, I, th I don't think she had burnt bridges there. The bridges were really, um, so it was about, there's, again, there's a lot to say about that, I think, about union politics at key junctures. And obviously 1926 was a key juncture where you got mm. um, a Labour leadership that was contested and renewed itself to a little bit, but not as much as you might expect. And then that was, you know, some of those people were then the ones who were, uh, negotiating with the Labour government that she was negotiating with in 1929 and didn't necessarily have very good relations with. Um, she had been seen by people like Citrine as, you know, uh, too close to people like MacDonald and Snowden because she had known them for a very long time and uh, been close to them on, you know, on, on, on uh, various different issues and obviously felt a bond of loyalty to them. I don't know whether that answers the question, but I think there's so she definitely was, she was, more to be said there. She was tarred with the same brush, really, because that, that, that the Citrine thought that government was a disaster, and then she becomes tarred with that same brush. Yeah, I think it would be interesting again to see whether in her personal papers there's a there's kind of her side of the story. Um, so, you know, for example, Skidelsky just pours scorn on that idea, but, you know, I don't know whether you've, you've read that, and, you know, just the way he describes her from the beginning, he even criticises the way she dressed, and, um, you know, criticised her voice, and you think from the beginning, where um, there was that claim about whether she'd set up the meeting with Stream, you know, he was more inclined to uh, believe that she was the liar. Um, so, also, yeah, opportunity yeah. today. Also, opportunity to look at Angela Rayner and what she's just been accused of in Parliament. You know, that these things are still going on, and we, you know, we we somehow got to try and look at ways that we can resolve that and bring them to the public uh, interest and make sure that people understand that there's a history behind these things. And it's very important mm -hmm. for us. I was really interested in the comment you made. There was a sort of throwaway comment about, and I think it was Paula's comment about the glass cliff. I wonder if just you'd like to elucidate on that glass cliff. I, it's a, the first time I've heard that. I've, I, I know about oh, the glass okay. ceiling, but now. The glass cliff is, that's the first time I've heard that. I'd like you just to elucidate on that a bit, if you wouldn't mind. Paul and I want to come in, but so the, the glass cliff analogy, this is, um, uh, Michelle Ryan has written about this. She's a psychologist and she um, gathered, uh, she looked at data from a, a, a lot of um, women CEOs. So what were the conditions under which they were appointed? And she found that um, in very many cases, women who were appointed to chief executive positions of, of corporations uh, were appointed at times when the corporation was in trouble. So they were um, kind of not set up to fail, but they were set up to deal with failure, essentially. They were called in when, when there was failure. And so obviously in those conditions, then there are quite high chances that the women who are called in, you know, will either then be thanked and sent on their way and somebody else will take over, or they'll then, you know, be forced to leave in ignominy in a few years time. So that's the idea of the glass cliff. And it, it does seem to apply here that she was, you know, yeah. set up almost to fail, given an impossible brief, um, you know, and then criticized for doing the job of, 
of anybody in a ministerial position who has to get legislation through parliament you need different deputations you you know she was criticized for adjusting the legislation in response to legislation and then she was criticized for not adjusting it enough you know so um i think there's a sort of that glass cliff analogy has the sense in which women are only invited in when there's a fairly good chance that there's failure if not already there then around the corner but also not given the resources that they need to be able to thrive and to make a good job of it i clearly need to widen my reading so thank you for that um thank you we're running to the end of this evening i i, I just think you've been absolutely uh, splendid christine coach has written do we, do we know how she spent her retirement um she was still invited so she she retired you know at a retirement age she was still uh, going in and uh, had a formal post with uh, gmw um was still involved with mary MacArthur homes um she was uh invited to sit on so she was invited to sit on a city planning commission at one point during the war um, she liked to travel if she could, so she did, uh, I think, at least a, one more tour of uh, America. But then, you know, gradually sort of um, retreated from the world. And, you know, by the time she, she did made that retreat, a lot of her erstwhile friends had died as well or, you know, were no longer available to her. So by the time she um, died, she had, in the last few years, she'd had to go into a nursing home and she uh, suffered from dementia. Um, so yeah, she kind of died on her own. Quite a sad end. Oh, it's really. very sad. That is sad. I mean, the, the, the whole the whole friendship with Mary MacArthur is something that's worth uh, looking into and, and exploring yeah. more, uh, uh, because th there's another very important person. So we've come, we've overrun our time by a there's minute. A so we've done, we've done fantastically well. Uh, we've coped with all the uh, technological problems. Uh, I know you've had a very tough day. You've been face to face with students today, and then you've come straight from that to this. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you giving your time. I, I think Margaret Bonfield is important to me because uh, I, I live in the West Country. I just think she's a very important person anyway, yeah. uh, not only in, in terms of uh, uh, trade unionism, but also in terms of the women's movement. And uh, I, I just need to thank you so much for that. Uh, I've just got to put in a quick advert for the next uh, Radical History session, which is about, you can see it there in the chat if you're looking, Valentine Acton and Sylvia Townsend Warner. I will not be here next month. It will be Hannah, Dave, uh, Hannah who is taking over the, uh, the chair because I'm away. I'm actually getting away on holiday. This is two left-wing poets from Dorset who have a fascinating story. Uh, and uh, I've forgotten the lady who's giving the talk, but she's actually written a book about them. Oh, here it is. It's A Transgressive Life by Francis Bingham. Francis Bingham is uh, the main speaker next month. So that should be really exciting. So thank you very much again to you, Susan. Thank you to everyone who's turned up. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in July, when I'm back from holiday, and uh, we'll be looking at the contribution of the Shire Hall to radical history in the West Country. Good night, all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.